Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for listening to our content and please like and subscribe. Hey guys, so we have got lots of questions about the cool swag and merch. And for a limited time, you can get on our website, pureathleteinc.com, and you can order all sorts of uh, different stuff. We're gonna have youth sizes, girls, guys, all that stuff, hoodies, some hats. So take advantage of that. We thank you for the support and uh, a lot of great stuff to come. Well, guys, what a great time we have with Ryan Howard. Philly slugger. I know he's a Philly uh, for you two guys, but uh, you know, he's just such a such a good man, a great role model. And I think the cool thing was that I got out of his again was just I think it's so cool how with his kids, he's letting them develop the passion for whatever they want to do. Yeah, I have to say I, I've uh, I've grown up rooting against Ryan Howard, and he just killed the Braves. But it's hard not to root for him. Yeah, when you know him. He. Uh, Man, what a what a great story! What a great guy! I love what he's doing at the Rickwood Field yeah. deal here in June. So uh, it's, it's a it's a great episode. And he gave a great answer. I think Jeff asked, um, "Who's one player you wish you could have played with?" And he gave a really cool answer that I think the, the listeners will enjoy. Yeah, That's a good tease, Brad. Yeah, yeah look really, at that really dropping the tease. Impressive. Impressive. Yeah, but I, I told you this, man. I, he was a teammate of mine in '15, and I mean, he worked hard and. I still say to this day he could have been on his way to the Hall of Fame if he didn't tear his Achilles on the final out of was crazy. of the uh, NLCS against the Cardinals. So, you know, he, he was a great power hitter but an even better guy. And so uh, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and as Brad said, he gave you a good tease too. So good job, Brad. Thank you. Before we get to the podcast, if you have middle school or high school kids that play sports and you don't want to fundraise like me, we got you covered. My buddy Chris Carneal owns Booster. Chris? We help schools and sports teams raise funds in a super fun and engaging way. In fact, the last 22 years, we've raised $750 million and we can't wait to help you. Choose Booster.com. Welcome back to Pure Athlete. I'm Jeff Francoeur along with Brad and Britt. I introduced yeah, you first Yeah, you gave me first today. plug today. Yeah. I appreciate Try that. Try to change it up a little bit. Real but honored. I'm so excited today. Uh, today's guest is a, a great friend of mine, a guy that I hated playing against in Philadelphia because the bell rung at least once every game when he hit a home <laughs> run, but was became a teammate of mine in 15 when I went there. The pride of Missouri State, Ryan Howard. Thank you for joining us, man. Hey, thank you for having me, bud. Hey, I, I know you you rang that bell a few times uh, in that uniform and, and against as well. I, I used to watch that that Frank Hoor swing um, put some balls in the seats as well. Bro. Well, I always tell the story that I had the rookie of the year one in 2005 until this guy in September. What, you hit 14 home runs in September? I don't know. I mean, I remember you came up and you were hitting like 600 for the first three months of the season. So it was it was a little back and forth. I was like, all right, I got to pull a rabbit out the hat right here. And he did. I, I think you did. I, I'll have to look. But it was like 12 or 14 home runs he hit in, hit in September. And I remember Brian McCann, you know, was awesome. And he's – I think the second to last game of the season, he said, I think we Ryan made a hit two in one game the last week. And he's like, well, there goes your rookie of the year. <laughs> and I just remember laughing. Uh, uh, I, I got to tell you, Brad and I are, are native Atlantans and lifelong Braves guys. And Ryan, you just wore the Braves oh, out. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. The time. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I tell you what, I, I tell you what, fellas, like, Frenchy, B Mac, Chip, like all those guys were like, those were definitely some of my favorite, like favorite Braves, like being able to play against them and just uh, going up every single time. B Mac would always say, like, he, he's like, dude, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know how to pitch you. <laughs> like, we, they, they'd go over the, the, the pitcher's meeting and it's like, hey, is he hitting the ball to left field? If he is, like, who's next? You know, it was it was always fun. I always enjoyed like competing against competing against the Braves. I always loved the weather. And now I'm in Atlanta, man. Now, now I'm a Georgian. That's so, great. Yeah, well, that's welcome. And you're back in you're in God's country. 
put the food on the table and it brought me in and now it's taking my tax. Exactly. <laughs> See, I remember Tim Hudson one time, I think Howie hit two or three off him in that one game and he said, next time I'm just going to put one right in his ribs. I'm like, <laughs> probably the smartest thing you could do. I, I don't know if I'd do that. Let him just go to first. But uh, before we get to your sports journey, I want to talk just for a second because I think it's so cool. Um, you have kind of the, the lead ambassador for MLB on June 20th. Uh, a game. I, I actually played at Rickwood Field in high school. We had a summer tournament there, which was incredible, but you will be there. Tell us a little bit about what you're uh, doing there on June 20th. Yeah, man, it's it's been great. Um, you know, it's the, the Rickwood Classic that's been taking place at Rickwood Field. So Rickwood Field was the home of the Birmingham Black Barons, um, one of the, the, the Negro League teams. Uh, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest stadium in the United States. Um, I think it's great in terms of, of what Major League Baseball is doing and being able to go and honor uh, these great gentlemen and pioneers in the game of baseball for black baseball and bringing that to the forefront. Um, it's going to be the game between the St. Louis Cardinals and San Francisco Giants, you know, um, and it's going to be great. It's going to be great to be able to get down there and I think have that great showcase to, again, honor these men who – played in the Negro Leagues who helped to kind of pave the way for me and other black baseball players. So looking looking forward to it. I think there's going to be a softball game. So might have to uh, try to stretch out and run a little bit. There's <laughs> there's two rules of softball games, man. Don't strike out and don't blow out. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Hey, just hit a homer and you can walk around the bases. You know, then you don't have to worry about it. Touch home plate and go back. I was seeing some stuff. How cool was it? I know you got a chance to call some of the Negro League players and kind of invite them. How cool was that? Bro, so I went I went down. I got to go down and, and meet them face to face and and sit there and talk to them and being able to hear their stories. Man, it was it was amazing. My my uh my family, my parents were both born and raised in Birmingham. And so um, my grandfather played at Rickwood Field and played in some of the industrial leagues back, um, you know, in the mid early 1900s. And uh, just the stories my uncle would tell me all the time. He's, he's like, you got your baseball talent from from your grandfather. He's like, either he'd hit it a mile or he'd strike out. So I was like, I fell, I fell right in, fell right in. So I was like, I got you, Grandpa. So, uh, but no, but it was great to be able to go and meet all those gentlemen and and just the sheer joy um, and being able to share their stories, them being able to share their stories and just having us kind of come in there and, and have those conversations, them reliving it. You can see them go straight back to those moments. So that was really, really cool for me. And uh, just, again, being able to pay homage to them for, for what they were able to do and endure. And I will tell you this. They played the game for the love of the game. Like we, we would get to the point in minor leagues, you know, we complain about in our bus rides and stuff. These guys were on buses with no air, you know, they were going from town to town, but then you also got to throw in the dynamic of what was going on in, in the country with segregation and having to deal with all of that. So for them to go to different places and having to, you know, deal with those, uh, those types of restraints and issues. I mean, you're truly, truly playing the game for the love of the game. Well, I'll tell you what, man. It's it's going to be a it's going to be a great day, and there's no one better to to be able to do that than you and be there, man. As much as you do in the community, and uh, again, I said you're one of my favorite teammates. And so now let's talk a little bit. I, I know you got a, an older son that you coach. You're coaching your daughter, but give me your best youth sports story growing up in St. Louis. Oh, wow. Um, best youth story growing up in St. Louis. I mean, I'd probably say there's just, there's so many. Um, I'll say there was one time I was playing, this probably may not be the best, but it's the one that kind of sticks out. And I remember we were warming up. I was warming up before one of my games and was playing catch with one of my teammates. I don't know. I was probably like 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. So wasn't paying attention. Boom, gets smoked in the eye, right? Right before the game. Eyes like swollen. 
swollen shut. And it's like, I go up and I'm like, you, you know how we are. Like we get hit in the eye. I'm like, all right, it's my fault. I wasn't paying attention. I'm still playing. Yeah. I'm not coming out of the coming game. Coming out of the lineup. So I go up there playing in the game, got one eye, hit a homer and a double. Wow. You know, it's just, you know, it's just like, all right, maybe I need to do this <laughs> more, <laughs> more often. often. But, uh, but, you know, it was one of those things where it was just like, kind of a freak accident prior to the game, but I guess it just made me concentrate more with the with the one eye and let the ball get deep. And try you got it. locked in. So that deep. I got locked in. So, so Ryan, take us back uh, to those days in St. Louis, and did, when did you start playing baseball, and what other sports did you play, and just kind of take us a little bit through that, through that journey. Yeah, I would want to say I probably started playing baseball around the age of – five, six, um, my, my parents noticed, I guess when I was younger, maybe like two, three years old, I used to back in the day, we used to have the big fat red plastic bat. And so I used to like stand in front of the TV when you had the, like the game of the week or the Cardinals were playing. And I used to like imitate the players on TV. And so they kind of saw my swing or whatnot. And, um, then they put me in baseball and I, I didn't really think too much about it. Like at that age, it was just, my mom was like, Hey, you hit the ball harder and further than like the other kids. And I just really loved playing baseball. Cause it was like, I can go get dirty and not get in trouble for it. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, growing up played, played everything, played baseball, basketball, soccer, didn't play football Frenchie until I got to high school, got hurt both years. So, um, you know, but, you know, just uh, really just focused on playing everything, but played baseball and basketball all throughout throughout high school. I used to tell Ryan all the time, your mom wouldn't sign the permission slip for him to play football. <laughs> I think he made she the right not. choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I know, probably right? so. Ryan, when did you um, – I know you said your parents kind of saw that you had talent, but when did you kind of realize – Hey, I, I may be able to to play in college. I mean, and not. I mean, obviously pros, but like, when did you start saying, "Hey, I may have a future in this game"? You know, I think people saw it. People really saw it in me before I ever saw it. I guess in myself because basketball was my first love, and um, always enjoyed doing that. And I always I, I loved playing baseball because I love the competitive nature of it's me against the pitcher. You know, it's like that one on one competition from the baseball standpoint, but always just loved basketball. And, and, you know, and then when point guards became six, nine, seven foot, I knew I had no shot (laughs) for basketball. So, you know, the the focus was always there and and, uh, for baseball. And I always I always looked at baseball as just like, you know, hey, let's let's take it to the next step. So if baseball can get me to to college and get the scholarship, you know, get a college scholarship to go play, then I'm going to go ahead and ride that wave and see what happens after that. But I think it wasn't until I got to college where my college coach shot out coach G Keith Gutton, Missouri state This is actually his final season. Um, He's been there for like 40 years. So in the history of Missouri state baseball, there's only been two coaches and the coach that coached before coach G was coach Rowe and you know he's he's still around as well and um they've got a great program over there but coach g was the one who who taught me how to take the ball to the opposite field he was the one who opened up my horizons because believe it or not i was a dead pool hitter up until that point dead pool so uh when he opened up the field and kind of changed my foul poles from gap to gap i mean that's when things just really kind of took off for me Talk about your like so Missouri State is not a mate you know not a major name in college baseball so you weren't really were you not highly recruited at all coming out of high school did folks not really come after I, you I had some I had some good looks I mean like just I wasn't the best at taking tests so when you had to take like the 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 SAT ACT or whatnot like you know I bet. I, I didn't do as well as I wanted to do on it, but I had gotten some looks from like some some of the uh, the, the bigger schools, Arizona State, Mississippi State were pretty much in Nebraska, K State, some of the other schools. But I mean, I think it was going to come down to it, it came down really between Mississippi State and Arizona State, and um, verbally I was like I was going to go to Arizona State, and I had never been to Arizona in my life, hadn't even been out on the visit or whatever. I think this was when Pat Murphy was out there coaching. 
And so um, hadn't been out on a recruiting trip or anything, but I was like, hey, Reggie Jackson and Barry Bonds went to Arizona State. So it's one of the best best baseball schools in the country and one of the best baseball conferences in the country. So I was like, hey, this, this would be where I go. I would go. But, hey, God works in mysterious ways and put me where I needed to be. Because after going out to Arizona, man, I was like, yeah, there's there's probably no way I would have made it out of <laughs> yeah. Arizona. State. Yeah, exactly. So there's too many distractions out there. So he's like, you need to go ahead and go over here to Missouri State. But – I enjoyed it, man. And, and, and the one thing I love, and I'll, I'll speak very highly of, of Coach Gutton down there, was he was straight up with me. He was straight up because when I, when I finally got eligible, uh, you know, I went down there on my visit and he told me, he's like, hey, we'd love to have you, but we don't have any more, we don't have any more scholarships. We don't have any more spots, you know, for scholarships. So you'd be a walk on and you'd have to compete against two junior college transfers. So he's like, I can't guarantee you time or anything. And me being me, just Frenchy, you know, my competitive nature. I was like, where do I sign? Bring it. Yeah. Because I wanted to see like as a true freshman, like, all right, you got these junior college transfers coming in. I'm not afraid of competition. Like, let's go. So, you know, and the rest was history. Ryan, go, going back to uh, going back to high school and, and even earlier, I mean, were you always a gifted hitter uh, from the very beginning? How, did you train hard? What? How, how did you develop your skills? You know, a, a, as a young kid, I was very, very raw. I was. I mean, it was uh, just. I just had, I guess, naturally like more power, more pop than a lot of the other kids. My dad, you know, took my brother and I to the to the family fun kind of batting cages. It's got the bumper boats and yeah. mini golf and all that stuff. And, you know, he, he gave us the biggest bat he could find and put us in the fastest cage and said, hit, you know, and, and it was use your wrist, use your wrist, use your wrist. And so like, I was a very wristy kind of hitter early on. And then just the more I went, man, Hey, six tokens for five bucks. I was over there like every other day, you know, hitting and just, kept getting after it. So, I mean, I was just very raw and just kind of worked on it myself. I don't think it was really until my junior year of high school, junior, senior year was when I really got to going in and um, kind of getting lessons and, and, and stuff like that and trying to work. You ever think in today's landscape, you know, what you talked about, junior, senior year, getting lessons now, eight, nine, 10 year old, all this travel ball playing a hundred games. You ever think what your path might've been like if you were coming up today? Um, probably the same. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a, it's such a different animal now because again, right. We played, we grew up playing multiple sports where I think now the focus is, Hey, you got to pick one sport because this is all year, all year round. Like we could play, baseball in the spring and you could play football or basketball or soccer in the fall and still do fall baseball. Right. But the priority was whatever the fall sport was, you know, and baseball was at, at that time was like, Hey, I'm just going to keep getting reps and, and doing all that. But I think now it's like, Hey, we want you to just focus on this particular sport. And I think with the pricing of everything, Cause you got to pay just to be on the team. And if you want lessons, you got to pay on top. <laughs> you got to pay on the way. I'm like, that's not a part of the, of being on the team. Like you have the facility. So, you know, all that stuff you've, you've got to pay extra for to where with some of these other sports, like you can't necessarily afford to try to go do the other sports because you're paying so much for, for your kid to just be in the one sport right now. Hmm. You know, you think about – I love how you're talking about that. I know your mom and dad played a huge part and for you. What was that dynamic like at home? Did they – like, you know, were they – did they did they push you? Was it was it uh, half and half or how did they tag team? It was, it was good. Pops definitely was the one I got the intensity from. 
like my parents could not sit together at my games because my mom was like the even kill, like, you know, good, like just, Hey, you're, you're going to be fine. You're all right. You're going to be fine. Pops was just like, he'd be fired up, like ready to go. So I'd, I'd be in my games at Missouri state. And obviously like I find my parents in the stands or whatever pops is up pacing around and mom's is just sitting there calm, cool, collected. So it was, it was a little bit of, it was, uh, Definitely the intensity came from, from my dad. So, um, but then the even keelness came from, from my mom. So in, in, in baseball, it was one of those things where it was like, Hey, you just had to find that happy medium of how to make both of them work. Ryan, did you, uh, did you ever struggle, uh, athletically at any time, you know, growing up and, and how did you, how did you deal with that? If you did, uh, I'm sure you had slumps in your major league career. Everybody does, but just wondering what your advice would be to, to young kids as they're going through adversity. Yeah. I mean, I think that everybody at some point is going to go through a slump or, 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 or struggle. Um, you know, one of the things that I would always do if I was in the big leagues and, and I'm, and I'm struggling, you know, first thing is we get to the point to where we're thinking way too much, right? My, my old manager, Charlie Manuel used to say, French, you know it, Hey, an empty head means a full back. <laughs> yeah. right? So, so it's one of those things where you just sometimes have to go back to just saying see ball, hit ball. And I would get to the point to where I'd say, you know what? My next two, three ABs, I'm just going to go up here and jam myself. So that way I'm allowing the ball to travel. I'm tracking the ball. And no matter what happens, if I get out, I get out. But at least now I'm tracking the ball because you can always work from back to front. It's always harder to work front to back. And, um, you know, for everybody who plays, you know, baseball or softball, in that sense, they'll understand what that means. But just... Once you go into slump, I mean, the slumps are, are just mental. You got to clear your head and you got to understand that, hey, I know what to do. I know how to play the game and just continue to keep confident. Like when you lose your confidence, it's, it's a wrap. So you got to stay confident, even in slumps. Like you're going to go up there and Barry Bonds told me one time, like, you know, I was, I got the chance to kind of work with him for, for a week and, and, pick his brain a little bit. And he said, when you go up there and you put the bat on the ball and you hit a hard line drive and the guy at second base makes a diving stop, what did you do wrong? I was like, nothing. He's like, exactly. When you hit the ball, when the ball comes off the bat, it's out of your control what happens. So if a guy makes a diving play or you hit it right at somebody, all you can do is just try to hit the ball on the screws as best as possible, get a good pitch, good to put, get a good pass on it. And the rest is out of your control. So you just got to continue to stay within yourself and just continue to stay confident. I, I love what you said a little bit ago when you were talking about college, because I, I know the competitive nature that you have and the drive, you know, in today's landscape, how do you fight back against, like you said, you welcome the opportunity, you know, let me go to college, let me win the job. I saw, I don't know if y'all saw, but at, uh, Tyra Matthew was talking about at LSU how he is who he was, the honey badger in the NFL, because he sat behind two All-Americans and had a fight every single day. And I'll say one thing about Ryan that people probably don't know, but when I got there in 15 with the Phillies in spring training, me and you spent about an hour after practice every day on the backfields with Charlie Manuel hitting. We were there in the cage before, and so mm -hmm. people just see you up there, Ryan, hitting 50 home runs a year doing this, but you worked your butt off to get where you were. In today's landscape with your kids, social media, phones, this, how, how, do, you, how do you fight against that for these kids to get out there and play? I think the key is, is one, you've got to continue to try to make it fun. Um, I think we're, we're in a dynamic and in an era of where, like when we were coming up, we could get yelled at, but we learned how to use that as like motivation. Right. And it would toughen us up. I think there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of kids where it's like, they, they can crumble. 
you know, it, the, the minute they get yelled at, they crumble. So you have to find the happy medium in terms of how to be able to motivate the kids. And one of the things I do when I'm with like my daughter's softball team is we just, we try to have fun first and foremost. And it's just a very positive, uplifting atmosphere, right? You got to get on them a little bit every once and again, but it's like, it's nothing like we're, we're screaming and hollering at the kids and, 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 or anything like that. But it's like, you're trying to be motivative, but you're, you're trying to make it fun and engaging for them to work and get better. So it's, it's really figuring out what it is that fuels each person on your team, because everybody's different. You may have that one kid that you can kind of yell at him or get after him a little bit, and he's going to respond or she's going to respond differently. The other kid, hey, got to handle them with white gloves. You know what I mean? Like, it's all about how you motivate these kids to be able to want to go out and continue to get get better. How was it for you with Darren, your oldest, as y'all walk through that landscape? <laughs> In high school and coaching him, you know, I, we talk about your dad with you. How are you with him? I was very like, again, very motivative, um, uplifting in that sense. And, um, you know, just he, he used to come with me. Right. So he, he grew up with his, he, he lived with his mom in Kansas city. And, um, you know, when he was with me, like in the off seasons, I was like, Hey, the choice is yours. Right. I'm up 545. I'm out the door at 630. Getting a hit, going to hit, going to lift. If you want to come, you're more than welcome. If not, I understand. So I wasn't forcing him to do anything. The choice was his. He's up. He's up with me. Hey, we go hit. We go work out. And so that way it was like we're hitting together. So it, I felt like for him, the best or for me and for him, I'm like the best way for him to try to learn is like me showing him by him watching me putting in the work the same way you say, I, I tell kids all the time. Um, uh, I actually got to talk to a buddy of mine here in Atlanta, his son's team. And I said, you know, one of the most important things is, is when you watch a guy like, a Ronald Acuna or Ozzy Albies because they're all Braves, Braves yeah. fans. <laughs> I was like, what you guys see is the finished product. What you don't see is Ronald Acuna in the cage taking extra BP or doing what he needs to do to prepare for the game. You don't see Ronald Acuna pregame working out, lifting weights, taking extra fly balls, doing what he needs to do so that when he gets in the game, it's effortless because he's put all the work in behind the scenes and that requires sacrifice. So like you said before, the previous question about how do you get these kids, you know, off social media or, or, you know, video games. And I'm like, I told them, I'm like, look, bro, there's a time for that. But if you got to really ask yourself what you want, if you want to play baseball at the next level or whatever sport, basketball, whatever it is, if you want to play it at the next level, college or potentially pro, like something's got to give. You can play your video games and, and do all that stuff and hang out with your friends, but go get those swings in first. Get that lift in. Like my, my boy, uh, Reggie, one of my, we grew up together, played high school ball and, and everything. And he coached, coached high school football in Florida. Yeah. And, um, you know, he'd have me come out and come talk to his team. But every time he would introduce me, he was like, when we were growing up, he's like, he made it. He's like, Ryan made it because like we would go and hang out and I'd hit him up and say, Hey, right. We about to go over here or go out or go do this or whatever. And he would always tell me like, Hey, I'll meet up with y'all after I go get this workout in or after I get these swings in, you know? And so you have to be willing to make those sacrifices and put in the work and put in the time because it's not just going to be given to you. You have to go and make it happen and take it. Ryan, uh, one of our themes here at Pure Athlete is kind of really, we, we have athletes on there to, to kind of really provide role models for, for kids. Who were your role models growing up? Who'd you look up to uh, that you wanted to be like when you were a kid? Um, I mean, obviously it's, uh, everybody has their, their sports stars. So like growing up you're, for me, it's, 
you know, Jordan, um, Ken Griffey Jr., Bonds, you know, Tony Gwynn, th- those guys. Um, but I think it's very important, too, for kids to understand that they may not necessarily be the athlete athlete, but your parents, like they're the people you see every day. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's important for the parents to understand that they're the biggest role models their kids are going to ever see and have because they're around them 24 seven. So how they conduct themselves, how they go about their business, whether they're, you know, whether they played a sport or just how they do what they do on their daily, you know, their daily jobs and things of that sort. Um, the parents are a big role models. So like for me, it was kind of like, you know, my parents work, moms worked at the, uh, phone company for like 30 years. Dad had, you know, uh, computer, computer information kind of job with, uh, I think it was like Boise cascade and Boeing back in the day. And so it's just like seeing them and, and how they kind of carried themselves. And again, my dad's tenacity, um, those, those were things that, kind of helped push me and mold me like as I was growing up. But I mean, yeah, you have the, the, the prototypical sports people that you would look up to as well. But I don't, I think you, you have to look at your parents and how your parents carry themselves and how they go about doing their daily regiments. Yeah. I love those last two answers, Ryan, because a lot of what we talk about here is, you know, most, most kids aren't going to play at the next level. Uh, but there's so many life lessons to learn from sports and, and that whole idea of you got to work to achieve things, whether it's on the field or off the field, uh, you got to make sacrifices and you got to work. And, and that's, that's one of the beauties that kids learn from sports. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we love that. Uh, you got a question. I, I think more of kind of the middle school, high school, you know, baseball season's getting ready to start and a lot of kids watching this. You know, what are what are one or two things that you would tell them from a hitting standpoint that you you made sure you did every day or you know you gotta be successful to do these one or two things? Um, I would say the biggest thing that I've noticed with a lot of like kind of youth sports that I'm constantly dealing with with my daughter's softball team is you can't hit what you can't see. First things first is you have got to track the ball and watch the ball hit the bat. Um, I've, I've had conversations with people and this, this is going to be throwing it out there because a lot of these kids may not necessarily know what this is. Pepper, <laughs> like playing pepper. Like we used to play pepper, like when I was younger, just prior to games and it helps your hand eye coordination because the first thing you're doing is just you're tracking the ball you're watching the ball hit the bat so it's one of those things to where if you're not watching the ball all the way to the bat like you're not gonna you're not gonna hit it two you don't have to i think a lot of kids it's just understanding their timing um like this is the first year for kid pitch you know from from my daughter so it's like now you're having to start to get loads and the one thing I try to tell kids is like, Hey, when, when, when I move, you move, right. If I'm pitching. So my old hitting coach, um, Wally used to tell me all the time. He's like, Hey, it's a dance between the pitcher and the hitter. So you've got to be in rhythm and in sync with the pitcher so that as he's, or she is moving, like you're loading and you're ready to go. So it's just, it's, seeing the ball, watch the ball all the way to the bat, regardless, any other thoughts. If you, if you, if you get too many swing thoughts, just remember, watch the ball hit the bat. Cause I tell the girls, like, I don't care what you do. <laughs> I want you to watch the ball hit the bat. That's it. The rest will take care of itself. That's, that's nice and simple. Yeah. Hey, describe you and Jeff, y'all describe what pepper is for our audience. Other, you know, a lot of people see it at the ballpark, no pepper allowed. Y'all describe what pepper is for our audience. (laughs) You, you want a Frenchie or what? Go ahead. I mean, it's, you know, like you said, you get, you get, I mean, yeah. Oh, no, no. Like, I mean, pepper, you've got what about, uh, 
a good safe game of peppers, no more than four guys, yeah. right? So four to five guys. You could have maybe four guys that are lined up defensively. You have one guy with the bat. You're probably like uh, seven feet away. And so you have the guys that are on the line with their with their gloves. They're basically the defensive guys. And you have the guy with the bat, and he's just taking like a small little check swing and he's just trying to pepper the ball back to each guy. Yeah. Now, if you hit a line drive or a pop fly and the guys catch it, whoever catches it, now they get to go hit. So it was – Pepper was a great game for back control, hand-eye, because you'd have kids diving. Defensively, they're tracking the ball. They're watching the ball. They're anticipating like – because you don't know who the person is going to try to hit the ball to. Oh, and by the way, there's a line. So – Depending upon who number one was down to number three or four, if the ball got past number two, then number three got to move up to number yeah. two, and then number two had to move to the end of the line. So it, it's just one of those kind of just pregame types of things that it's – I like to say it's Miyagi style because yep. you're doing all this stuff without realizing what you're doing by working on your hand-eye as a hitter – watching pitches and your defensive hand eye as well for the guys that are trying to catch the ball and, and tossing the ball. And I think to add to that too, you got to tell it's quick pace. So you get it, you throw it, you know, it's not yeah. like you're, you're trying to yeah. get things going and it, it's and if great. They throw I, it, and if they throw it by you, if they throw it by you, you swing and miss that guy who threw it gets to go hit. So they're trying to get you out with pepper. They're trying to get you out. Ryan, I mean, obviously baseball is a game of routine. So kind of what did, you know, and players like to stick to routine. What was your game day routine like? What did, what are certain things you always did before a game? Um, well, towards the end of my career was you get there early, extra early, and then go in and go do a uh, cold tub, hot tub contract. Activate the, the body. Get the body, get the body right. Do the activation. Um but then after that, it was, you know, get get ready, go down, go take some swings, do my my uh, my routine in the cage, a little bit of tee work to get started, get loose, and then do some flips and then come up and just kind of relax before we got out for, for batting practice and do the, the batting practice stuff and come back in, grab something to eat, shower, get ready for the game, change, and – Go in and get stretched and go out and get ready to do some damage. <laughs> yeah. Simple as that. Not hard. I like it. <laughs> you know, you, you, were, well. you were one of the leaders up there in Philly. Um, we talk a lot. We have five pillars, character, different stuff, but you were a high character guy when you played. What What are a couple of the guys that, that you always thought were good leaders and why? I mean, obviously playing with the, the two guys um, – to my right were, you know, with Chase and, and Jimmy, um, those guys were, were great to where everybody saw, you know, Chase was the hard nose, kind of the, the, the nails, you know, just the hard, just gamer type guy. And then Jimmy was the swag, right? Jimmy was the, the confidence and the swag and, Jimmy was the guy, as you know, he, Jimmy was going to let it be known. He was going to speak, speak his piece, speak his mind. Chase was one. He was one of those guys who more led. He was one of those quiet leaders in a sense to where he led more by example. I like to think I was more of a kind of lead by example, try to lead by example kind of guy. But you know that when Chase like spoke up and said something like, all right, this is serious. Like he, he, he spoke. You know, so um, and I, I think that was one of the things that made our team so good was like everybody was kind of a leader in their own right, because we had so many different personalities where I mean, again, you had like a, a Jason Worth, who was the sarcastic kind of dry humor, but intense, you know, when it when it was time to get intense type of guy. So um yeah, I mean, definitely those those guys were all big, big factors. And then Pat Burrell was just Burrell. Pat the bat. Pat the bat. Pat was the Pat bat. The bat. 
<laughs> he was great. Uh, we're gonna have he fun for a second. I want to ask a couple rapid fire questions that that people enjoy. What was your favorite ballpark to play in? Obviously, outside of Philly. <sighs> um, I'll say. I mean, I have a couple, but I mean, being here in Atlanta. Real rough for some feathers. We'll say Turner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he hit a hundred home hit, runs. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Couldn't wait to get here. Uh, what's your most memorable home run outside of your your first one you ever hit? Ooh, um, I'd probably say the homer in 2006 off of Mike Musina that went to the third deck in Citizens Bank Park, and seeing Brett Myers and Ryan Matson's reaction like when it landed up there and then i think they panned over to joe tory and joe's joe's face was just like <laughs> just it was one of the best stone faces i think I've ever <laughs> perfect <laughs> who's the toughest pitcher you ever faced Ooh, toughest pitcher man i i'd probably have to say scherzer um and scherzer was so tough man because He's one of those guys to where he will throw you any pitch and any count and does not care. Even if you hit him, a lot of guys will kind of fade away from a pitch. Like if you hit a fastball and you hit a homer off him off a fastball, he's coming right back at you. Um, you know, I think his competitive nature is why he is who he is and he does what he does is because – Hey, you, you got me, but I'm still here. And that's one of the things I love about Scherz. And that's, that's why that guy's going to be a no doubt first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, who was your favorite coach and why? Favorite coach? I mean, I got to say, uh, obviously, like Charlie Manuel. I mean, I've had so many different coaches on, on so many different levels. I think, you know, Charlie and that coaching staff, um, the years we had the great runs that we had. We're just always very, very positive, very supportive, uplifting. Um, he kept – Philly is a tough place to play, um, you know, from a media standpoint at times, from a, sta a fan standpoint. And I think they did such a great job. I think Charlie really did a great job of keeping the media off the players so that the players could focus on playing and just him allowing us to be ourselves and – and going out there and going to, and, and playing. Like that. Last one. One guy you wish you could have played with in your career that you didn't. Ooh. Um, one guy I wish I could have played with. Uh, I'm going to say I wish I could have played with – I know what he's thinking right now. He's thinking, is there someone that's going to be well, mad if I don't say their <laughs> name right now? No, 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 no. I mean, this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back. I'm, I'm going to go to the, the Negro Leagues. I'm going to go Oscar Charleston. Yeah. So Oscar Charleston was every, like from what I've heard is like Oscar Charleston was the Willie Mays before Willie Mays. He was like, they, they were saying that this dude was all everything. He was the, like, the best of the best. So I would have loved to be able to, you know, played with him and, 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 and watch him, uh, watch him do his thing. Just, I would really love to be, you know, just kind of a fly on the wall and just kind of watch some of those games, you know, got the Josh Gibson's and Satchel page and see those guys play and see the stories from Satchel page and how he would strike people out. But I love the fact that they were, talking trash oh, God, in yeah. the game you know so it's it's that's that's the the part uh, you don't see anymore that, that yeah right well somebody's getting somebody's getting hit <laughs> so. uh hey ryan who do you like to watch hit today oh man uh so i had the pleasure of uh in the world baseball classic um last year going down to the to the finals and i got to watch otani hit bp in miami and he made that place look like i don't know it, uh, he made it look like cincinnati or like it was it, the, the ball the way the ball comes off is bad there's there's few players and Frenchie, we had those guys where you just watch and it's just different. Yeah. 
And I'm watching, having been a guy that was, you know, hitting long homers and I'm watching, I'm like, this guy is different. He is different. Like he's hitting balls, upper tank, straight away center field in Miami. Like balls don't do that. Yeah. With ease, effortlessly. And so it's just like, man, like it, it, I, I'm like, I get what people were talking about <laughs> when they would watch like McGuire and all those guys hit, but like Otani is bro. This dude is special. Yeah. It's special watching him. Yeah. They, DeRosa and McCann and those guys, you know, on the coaching staff, Andy Pettit, I heard them saying that they were all watching. They're like, how many times you see a coaching staff watching an opposing <laughs> player take BP? You know, like right, exactly. incredible finishing up here. Thanks for spending some time, but I, I got a couple questions to end here. What to all the athletes watching on here in any sport, female, male, what's your advice to them as, as they go through their youth sports journey? I would say the first thing is, is, you know, enjoy it. First and foremost, have fun and enjoy it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there can be a lot of undue pressures, um, you know, from parents, from coaches, you first thing is, is like, you've got to make sure that this is what you want to do because kids can have a tendency of getting burnt out. That's where like with me, it's like with my kids, it's like, like, I'm not going to put any pressure on you. Like, and I told my daughter, if you don't want to play softball, like you're not going to hurt my feelings. Like you don't have to do that. I was like, we'll, we'll start playing golf. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's doing whatever you're passionate about. And I think that's what it should be about because if you're a kid who's feeling external pressure or internal pressure to try to do something, you're going to get burnt out. That's the first thing I say is like, you got to enjoy what you're doing. Um, have fun with it. And the kids, I think for the parents, the kid will let you know if they want to pursue it. And then to me, I'm like, that's when you take it to the next level of saying, all right, we'll start getting lessons. We'll start doing all this stuff. Because if you show me you're dedicated, I'm behind you a thousand percent. So that's the first thing is I think the kids need to be allowed to show that they're ready to take that, that next step and not necessarily feel pressured to have to do it. Uh, but to make sure they're enjoying the games first and foremost. And then I think secondly, like once you make that decision, like I said before, then it becomes about putting in the work. It becomes about putting in the work because if it's baseball, if it's softball, if it's basketball, if it's football, like this could be something that can help change your life to where one, you're enjoying playing the game, but look at the opportunities that it could help provide you, you know? Uh, like I said, for me, I tried to use it as an opportunity to be able to to go to college, right? To where, hey, if I can try to work on getting a scholarship to school, if that's going to be my next step, then I want to try to see if I can go to whatever school and get a baseball, basketball, softball, whatever your sport is, scholarship, go do that, and then try to see about, hey, letting it take you to the next level, which would then be the professional ranks, so sports can be a great springboard. And, and I think as we discussed earlier, um, there's so many life lessons that you can learn from the game, especially baseball, because I, I would always say baseball is a game of failure because it's the only sport you can play where you can fail 70 percent of the time and still be considered like successful yeah, make, make millions and millions of dollars <laughs> and make millions yeah make make almost a billion dollars now <laughs> but uh but it's but it's also a game of um what's the word um oh, i forget the word i just i just drew a blank on the word but uh but it's 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 also a game where you just got to continue to uh you get to work through adversity, right? Trust so, the process. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a huge process, but it teaches you that in life because whether you're playing softball or playing baseball in uh, professional ranks or college ranks, when you get into the real world, you can take that stuff so that when you get into a situation, as we know as baseball, former baseball players, it's like, hey, you're only as good as your next at bat, Right. 
So whether you hit a homer or you struck out previously, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do in this current situation. And that's the kind of stuff that I think you can take into life where no matter what it is, no matter what happened previously, what are you going to do in this current moment? How are you going to respond and how are you going to react? Because uh, you can control your attitude and you can control the thought process, right? Sometimes you can't control the, the outcome, but you can control how you react to the outcomes. So that's, that's a couple of things I would probably tell kids. And, and lastly, for the, the baseball players or whomever, whatever level, if you want to get to the big leagues uh, or NBA or whatever it is, whatever level you're at, T-ball, through high school, through college, whatever level you're at, that is your big leagues. So mentally, like you go out, you carry yourself as a big leaguer, you carry yourself, you do everything you need to do. You train, you work, you walk, you talk, you do all this stuff, right? Acting as though you're in the big leagues, mentally you're there. Right. So that when you can and hopefully one day do get there and they ask you, hey, like, did you ever think you'd have this much success or, you know, all this? I've, I've been in the big league since I was 10 years old mentally. So you have to see yourself there in order to help it grow and manifest it. So whether it's NBA, WNBA, whatever it is, carry yourself in that light. And because my dad told me that when I was like 15, he's like, you have to carry yourself different. Because again, he saw something in me that I hadn't seen yet. But when he gave me that advice, like early on when I was like 15, I was like, I get it. So whatever level you're at, that's your big leagues. I love that. That's that's great. And my last question for you before we let you go, man, what's your advice to the parents? Final thing, because a lot of times we say parents get out of the way. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, really and truthfully, it's, it's, it's that it's just be supportive. Um, you know, I, your kid is going to let you know, I think ultimately, like you're going to see it in your kid. Cause there's, there's, there's some kids where you go out there and Hey, you can just see like, all right, this kid's got talent. They're going to be able to continue to, to play. Right. But even still, right. It's the happy medium of how much do I push my kid to the point to where they don't get burnt out, but that they're still very into what they're doing. And I, and I always say the kid will let you know, they will let you know, like, all right, I'm ready to push it into another gear to where I think as the parent, as you're kind of sitting back and watching a little bit, you'll be able to tell as well, like, all right, I can, I can turn it up a notch. They're going to be okay because they're responding in a, in, in the right way to, you know, how we're going about this. So we can do the training, we can do this, we can do that. We can get after it a little bit more because we're not having the knock them down. Hey, I'm going to complain type type stuff. They're actually getting out of at it. They're getting after it because it's what they want to do and not because it's what's expected of them. Well, Great stuff. Yeah. Man, Great I advice. can't thank you for joining us today. I know kept you oh, man, off the golf it. course from honing that golf game in, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. This was this was awesome. Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for checking out Pure Athlete and subscribe to our channel on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you go to listen to our podcast. Thank you.